Okay, how's it going everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, so in this episode, I want to try to say something about, um, about Picasso and his masterpiece painting, The Young Ladies of Avignon. Okay, so let's go back some uh, 116 years ago. Okay, so in 1907, at his home in the, um, in the infamous and run-down Bateau Lavoir, the 26-year-old Picasso finally showed to a few of his uh, artist friends the painting that he'd been working on in secret for a long time. Okay, now here's the thing. The reaction wasn't great, to put it mildly. For example, the, uh, the acclaimed French painter Matisse, who was there, thought it was some kind of, uh, some kind of hoax. Others thought it was a, a caricature. And some others yet thought that Picasso had gone completely insane. I mean, um, here's what some of them said when they saw it. The Fauvist painter, André Doran, said this. He said, One day we shall find Picasso has hanged himself behind this great canvas. And the, um, the soon-to-be famous Cubist painter, George Brock, actually said to Picasso, he said, It's as if you are making us eat rope or drink turpentine. Okay, so the point is, is that by, by any standards, the painting was, well, simply shocking. No one had ever seen anything like this sort of thing before. Now, for those of you who, who don't know, it's a painting of five nude women standing nearly seven feet tall, staring out at the viewer. Now, they're prostitutes in a brothel. Apparently a brothel located on Avignon Street in Barcelona. Hence the name it was eventually given, the Young Ladies of Avignon. Okay, well, so despite its, um, its rocky reception, it turns out that this monumental painting is now pretty much regarded as the first truly 20th century painting and the single most important turning point in the, um, in the evolution of modern art. Okay, so now I want to try to say something about the, um, about the style and the importance of this painting. But maybe the best way to do this is to first start off by, um, by saying something about Picasso's relationship with another great painter of the time, one I just mentioned at the outset, namely Matisse. Okay, so Matisse had a, had a pretty clear idea of what he wanted his art to do. What the French painter wanted to do was to create a world through painting in which sufferers can be relieved from their pain and where there was, um, let's say, minimal conflict. I mean, this is what he says in his memoirs, Matisse. He says, I am after an art of equilibrium and purity, an art that neither unsettles nor confuses. I would like people who are, who are weary and stressed and broken to find peace and tranquility as they look at my pictures. And uh, if you don't believe me, check out his uh, 1904 painting called Richness, Calm and Pleasure and his 1906 one called The Joy of Life, if you want to see this, uh, this peace and this joy and this sentimentality that he's talking about. Okay, now Picasso was uh, pretty good friends with Matisse. Actually, they were um, first introduced to each other by the, the art collector Gertrude Stein. But also, more importantly, Picasso was really in... Um, was really in competition with Matisse. You see, they were both determined to become the greatest painter of their own time. So realizing that Matisse had done as much as any painter with color, the one thing Picasso did to try to get a one up on him was to start concentrating much more on form. But the other thing that he did was, was to break from Matisse's um, sentimentality. And 
Well, we see this break from Matisse very clearly in the, the young ladies. In it, there's, there's no, more, no more tenderness, no more smooth lines, and no more graceful and uh, fluid figures lounging in the sun, like in Matisse. No, instead, what we get in the, um, in the young ladies is, well, what we get is the opposite. What we get is thickly applied and, and rough paint and uh, harsh angularity everywhere. You could say that in this painting, what Picasso did is he elevated the rough and the messy and the uh, savagery of form to a height it had never been at before. You know, it's interesting. According to the Korean philosopher, Byung Chul Han, we live in a society dominated by the smooth. It is the signature of our contemporary world. From iPhones to uh, Brazilian waxes, it's all about a concern for the smooth and the polished, he says. Now, why are we so attracted to, to smoothness? Well, he says it's because it connotes positivity and it doesn't offer any resistance. And what's more, he says that the smooth and the polished, they don't invite interpretation or reflection. They have no shallows. They have no craters. No depth, no ambiguity, they just are what they are. In fact, the smooth is often um, mirror-like, right? We see ourselves there. We become assured of ourselves through the smooth. But of course, this means that, uh, like Narcissus looking down at the clearest water, in a world of the smooth, we only ever encounter ourselves and not the other. So, there's no alterity. There's no opposition. Nothing outside of us to, to impinge on us. Nothing to test us. Nothing to um, shake us up. As Han says, all the smooth wants to do is to please. It, it doesn't want to knock us over. And so, there's nothing, um, there's nothing negative and nothing ugly in the world of the smooth and the polished. And well, if there's nothing negative or nothing ugly, you might argue that there's nothing existential about our lives either, right? Never Shakespeare's question of to be or not to be. Well, I think this is one reason why Picasso's The Young Ladies is just so important and so revelatory. From its thickly applied and rough paint, and its lack of finished surfaces, and its demonic barbarity, to its angular figures with their primitive masks and their alarming uh, Medusa stares, and the work's overall lack of classical proportion, this is a work of art all about alterity and, um, and opposition, and the rough and the tough and the ugly. As Picasso said later in his life, paintings should not be things that you uh, decorate your apartment with. No, this painting is about the shock of confrontation. I mean, the figures, they seem to emerge from the canvas with something like the effect that that train did in the early Lumiere films. The painting is just, it's in our face and it challenges and unsettles us, and even sometimes uh, emasculates us. And so, it has nothing to do with the, with the smooth, tranquil refuge of Matisse's uh, paradisal world. And uh, speaking of Matisse, well, not surprisingly, he saw the young ladies as an attack on him. Anyway, there's no way around this. The Young Ladies is just really an amazing act of, of destruction and of construction at the same time. You know, Nietzsche said that you need, uh, you need chaos to give birth to a shining star. Well, in my opinion, The Young Ladies was, uh, was Picasso's chaos. And not only um, 
is it its own star, of course, but the kinds of things that he initiated in this painting went on to give birth to many, many more stars to come. Something called Cubism, of course, included. By the way, another peculiar and um, interesting thing about the young ladies is that it's, it's, well, it's probably unfinished. I mean, one indication we get of this is the contrast between the, um, the African masked figures on the right with the um, unmasked Iberian figures on the left. So it looks a bit like a, like a painting in two separate halves, right? And as far as I understand, Picasso even admitted to this, uh, to this incompleteness. Okay, well, so what's going on there then? Well, who knows for certain? Maybe he just couldn't, uh, couldn't figure it out. And that's why, incredibly, he had this painting locked up in his room for, for 25 years, barely showing it to anyone. Or, or maybe not. Maybe this incompleteness was, um, was part of the message. But if this is true, it seems a bit hard for, for us to accept, right? And that's because we're just not very good when it comes to, um, to accepting incompleteness and, um, and indeterminacy. Actually, I think most traditional paintings show this. That is, they're often about trying to capture either um, totality or eternity. That is, some kind of um, moment totally free from flux. But the problem with this is that we just live in a time-bound world, right? And so it seems like it's a bit disingenuous to try to represent the world as something that it's just not. Actually, you know, books are another good example here. Like some traditional paintings, they too can also be somewhat deceptive. And that's because books, due to their um, tightly bounded form and the fact that they're made to, to close up afterwards, they give us the impression of completeness and of um, unification, don't they? Now that I think about it, the Bible is a good example here. I mean, we get the sense with the Bible, whether it's the, uh, the Jewish scriptures or, or the New Testament, that, that its internal contents are, are totally unified. But again, this isn't quite true. Several disparate books make up the, the Jewish scriptures. And when it comes to the New Testament, well, that was in reality just a, a body of texts in flux. It's really only our, our retrospective act of editorializing that has transformed it into something that appears totally complete to us. I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is that is that life isn't something that's always ordered and integrated and unified despite what art or books suggest. So whether he meant it or not, the fractured and fragmented and indeterminate aspects of Picasso's painting in its own strange way seems to express some fidelity to the real world. After all, he is quoted as having said, the world today doesn't make sense, so why should I paint pictures that do? Okay, well, I, I want to talk about uh, one last important thing here. You know, his creativity aside, there's something absolutely incredible about what Picasso did. It's estimated that he produced over 50,000 artworks during his lifetime. And I know this is a bit nerdy, but, but I did the calculation. And if we assume about, uh, about 70 years of uh, active work, although it's a bit more than that, then that amounts to, to something like creating two works of art every single day. Imagine. Some of us hardly do two creative things in a, in a lifetime. And what's even more remarkable is that 
that didn't include just, just painting, but it also included sculpture and ceramics and drawing and lithograph and even some poetry. Really, he was sort of a, a polymath artist. But even if we just stick to his output in, um, in painting, what's amazing is this. What's amazing is that he never stuck to one style. His restlessness and genius constantly pushed him to conquer new worlds in the, in the painting universe. I mean, he was all over the place, exploring symbolism and uh, surrealism and cubism and neoclassism, just to mention very few. Actually, you know, in his output and in his uh, eclecticism, you might say that uh, Bob Dylan in music draws some kind of comparison here. But okay, so what was it that pushed Picasso like this? Why the consistent and enormous productivity? The, the unrelenting urge to create? Well, okay, so I don't think it's a secret. I think it probably had something to do with his thanatophobia. And that's uh, ancient Greek for fear of death. So, okay, so let me explain. So Picasso, first of all, did lose his, uh, his sister when he was very young, and that certainly scarred him. And then later, he lost one of his best friends in a, in a suicide, whom he, he later memorialized in some of his paintings in what was known as his, uh, his Blue Period. And you know, it's interesting. From what I understand, in the first drafts of the, of the young ladies, there was originally a male figure carrying a skull, a traditional symbol of, of death, of course. And not only that, but I think that the, um, the African masks on the two women on the right is revealing here too. Now, why? Well, African masks were often used to, to ward off, among other things, the forces of death. And Picasso knew this since he actually talked about it briefly. Okay, so now why am I talking about all this? Well, so maybe the young ladies was not just meant to, um, to challenge the, the complete visual order of things, but also partly Picasso's way of exorcising the forces of death. Maybe he meant it as a kind of magical, powerful incantation against death, against Thanatos. But anyway, this doesn't really explain why it is he produced or, or created so much over a lifetime. So how is that connected to his fear of death and, and how does art offer some kind of relief from it? Well, okay, so the great German writer, Hermann Hesse, called the fear of death the root of all art. Again, why? Well, I don't know, maybe because by, by creating, the artist makes something last longer than he or she does. Now, if that's right, well, then that view goes back as far as the story of, uh, of Gilgamesh on through to Plato. But for some reason, I get the feeling that this wasn't quite Picasso's motivation or, or real mindset. Okay, so what was it then? Well, here's the thing. To create is to blow a little bubble of new life into the world, isn't it? And so it's to surround yourself with natality and freshness and vitality. In this way then, maybe art in its in its breath of new life, temporarily insulates us from the reality of an all the while increasingly decaying world. But eventually, of course, that larger world proves too much and Kronos eats his children. On the last night of his death, 
Picasso painted until 3 p.m. And then the next morning, his heart knew what his youthful mind didn't. That it has the last say. Bye for now.